So just to start off, um, I always like to explain why this event occurred. I've had conversations about how often we'll run into a space with women or other diverse groups, and they won't know that they're an accredited investor. They won't know what it means to get a venture capital, or they'll say something even sadder, which is, I tried to, but then... I wasn't given the opportunity. And so we started this, this series and we bring in folks, not only to provide the answers to the questions that you might have, but if you want to follow up later, for instance, I've had people follow up and say, there's actually something I wanted to do and I didn't know how to do it. And could you help me? And so we were able to make an introduction for them, right? And so that's what this is about. It's about uh, being a great resource, sharing resources, and of course, ensuring folks like us know what we can do in this industry. So Kimberly, since you're our guest this month, you want to start us off? Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. This is one of the topics that is nearest and dearest to my heart, as you mentioned, because of how little information is public or how little people tend to know about this asset class and what their options are. Um, so by way of introduction, my name is Kimberly Nixon. I'm the founder and managing partner at Open Venture Capital. We are on Fund One, targeting $10 million, and we focus on sport, health, and wellness. I probably say our focus area is different every time I have this conversation, just based on the audience and what people react to. But in general, uh, it is sport, health, and wellness because I'm an operator turned VC. That is my background. I've spent the majority of my career in those areas in sport, health, and wellness, and seeing around corners in those areas. And so now I leverage that operator background to help early stage founders as they're thinking through what their path to growth is, what their product roadmap looks like, and what their target markets uh, opportunities are. I also um, always take the opportunity to say that I'm incredibly focused on uh, diversity on my cap table. I'm sure we'll talk about what cap table means, but a, a diversity amongst my investors and I publicly I made a public declaration earlier this year that I was looking to bring 50 Black women onto my cap table as investors. I'm very, very happy to say we are moving right along with that number. And so we're very close to 42 and looking for my last eight, not last, but the last eight that I need to get to that kind of public goal, um, while also raising from larger institutional investors as well. And part of that, part of making sure that I hit that goal is being available for conversations just like these, which are all about making safe spaces, opening up the conversation and opening up the asset class to folks that look like me and, um, you know, incorporating education and um, making this an experience that's the first, not the last time someone thinks about investing in this asset class. Thanks for having me. And Laurel? Hi everyone, Laurel Mintz, uh, GP of Fabric VC. We are fund one as well, uh, only investing with a diverse lens. So only investing in queer, BIPOC and female led consumer tech with a carve out in future of healthcare, future of workspace. Um, I am tuning in from Los Angeles uh, per B's uh, uh, chat request. And um, I'm so honored to be doing this work. My background is that I was a corporate M&A attorney initially. Universe had a different plan for me, ended up having to take over a family business um, when my dad got sick and was a CEO at 26, really that's what taught me that I was an entrepreneur and I launched my first company, which was a marketing agency. That's now been around for 15 years, but because of that kind of confluence of skill sets, a ton of the PE and VC uh, teams have been coming to us for years to market them. Last year, one of the partners was like, you need to go raise a venture fund. I've never seen someone with earlier, better deal flow that actually has control over making these companies winners. I was like, you're fucking crazy, part of my French. And then I couldn't get it out of my head, mostly because of the conversation that we're going to have here today, which is a lack of diversity in this space. Um, I, I hopefully don't have to tell anyone who's here now that less than 2% of venture funding goes to people that look like the three of us on this call. And yet when we do receive venture funding, we return on average at a 25% higher return rate. So it's not just, um, as Jesse Draper would say, investing in diversity isn't a fucking charity. It's a great business opportunity. So I'm B. Pagels Minor, and I'm the founder and GP of Divergent Ventures. Divergent Ventures is a venture firm that invests only in middle America, which I consider to be the South, the Midwest, and the Mountain West, which is about 38 states. They receive less than 20% of all VC funding, yet represents over 66% 66 of the U.S. population, 60% of the GDP. 67% of women, 
55% of Latin folks, 77% of African Americans, and over 60% of the LGBTQ plus folks. And so just as a, a further point to what both Kimberly and Laurel said, I add also the fact that we have such a concentration in both the West Coast and East Coast for our VC funding is a reason that we also have this, this disparity in the amount of funding that goes to people like us as well. And so my regional focus has been, you know, um, part of my longer journey as being a Southerner who understands that, you know, some of the most badass, coolest people, you know, actually hail from there. We, we generate many presidents. I'm not gonna claim all them presidents, but we do generate some people, you know. We, we, we are a pretty great class of people, but we are, we're looking for additional investment. Let's get into it. So again, we start off with the most basic question, hoping to start to make your brain percolate, right? To make it a safe space to ask some other questions. So Kimberly, to get started, what is venture capital and how does it differ from other forms of investment? Sure. I thank you for leading me into the technical answer. <laughs> um, so when you think about venture capital, you should think about funding that helps a business to accelerate its growth with the intention of over a period of time, specifically this is this part is specific to venture, having an outsized return in relation to the initial investment that you made into said said. Um, business. And I'm using the word business here instead of startup because venture, although the parts that we talk about a lot and a par the parts that you hear about a lot are early stage venture, where you would use the term startup, um, venture as a full asset class really runs the gamut from early stage to late uh, to pre-IPO. And um, venture funds and fund managers choose the areas within which they want to invest both from an investment thesis, you heard all of us talk through our investment theses, but also the stage that they want to invest in based on based on their their own kind of formulas and formulation about where they can uh, achieve um, outsized returns uh, versus the, the, the dollars that they're investing. In venture, most of the time, those dollars are meant to be, um, to, to look like a uh, north of a 10x return for the fund for the companies that work. And that's because there's a power law dynamic that is in play for venture. You build a portfolio of companies that all fit within your investment mandate with the uh, with the knowledge and the intention that you will double down or make further investments into those companies that are performing well, but also with the knowledge that there are companies that you will invest in that will fail. And so you build a portfolio and amongst that portfolio, you intend for that power law to take place, meaning one to two of those companies will have incredible massive outsized returns and that will make up for several of the losses within the portfolio. Now, none of us go into this um, with the intention of having uh, failures within the portfolio. We don't choose companies saying they're gonna fail but we do make room for that possibility because otherwise we wouldn't allow ourselves to take the types of risks that we're taking. And so in order to be able to take that type of risk, you also need to be very thoughtful about how you mitigate those risks through your due diligence processes, through your areas of expertise, through having subject matter experts as advisors or um, as partners to your, to your portfolio team, um, being able to add wraparound or other value add services, or having um, some type of competitive advantage in terms of knowing who might be an acquirer for the companies that you're looking uh, looking to invest in. So within the venture space, you're talking about large risk, large return models, building a portfolio that supports that, and then finding your competitive advantage to make sure that you can see some exits within that asset class. The second part of your question, I'm sorry, was, like, how does it differ from other types of investments? Okay. So when I'm talking to individual investors about venture specifically, venture falls into the alternative asset class category. And so when you think about your personal investment portfolio as a whole, you're thinking through stock, um, public stocks, equity that you may have in a company that you worked at or that you previously worked at, real estate, um, bonds. Things of that mark, mar uh, things of that those categories which fall into um, into into equities, 
And then the alternatives you can think of as PEVC crypto, things where there are, um, again, large risk profiles associated with that investment of, of, of that asset class of investment. And what I normally say to people, although I am not a financial advisor, and I'll state that on the record, is that the way people think about alternatives is that a small percentage of your overall portfolio, somewhere between seven to 10%, is the amount that you wanna look at putting into alternative asset classes. That's because the rest of your portfolio, stock market, for example, historically will return somewhere between eight to 10% um, in annualized returns year over year. And so, if you were to lose every dollar that you put into that very, very risky asset class of PE or venture or crypto, your the rest of your portfolio should regenerate like a lizard's tail without having too much impact on your overall net worth or wealth. But if that alternative asset does work, then you have a return that is, again, outsized, has meaningful impact on your overall portfolio. And that is how you start a cycle of wealth and wealth generation and building is that you take those outsized returns, you, you decide for yourself what percentage of that return you want to put somewhere safe and what percentage you want to put back at risk. And now you're playing with the house's money. And so you want to start to find yourself in virtuous cycles of wealth building instead of vicious cycles of debt building. And that's the real power of venture. I just wanted to add one more note here because actually someone sent me a message this week on LinkedIn that was like, you know, but you know, but why venture instead of going to a bank? And so I, I want to just like, and that last point of like what venture capital does, you know, a lot of people who go to a bank, you need to have like a very clear business plan and they need to see like some previous history or they need to see examples of what that company looked like for them to make their investment. Venture capital, one of the reasons it has such outsized returns potential is because, you know, you're dealing with things that you know, no one maybe ever, you know, contemplated before, you know, before SpaceX or before Google, these concepts of like search engines or things like that didn't exist. And so, you know, the, these are ideas that would not be great examples for traditional um, financial investment. And so I, I, I wanted to make sure we clarified that point um, as well, because I thought it was interesting that we got that, that, that question on LinkedIn. Now, let's go over to Laurel. So, one of the things that's kind of interesting to me and something that I realized is um, a lot of people don't understand, like, what does it mean to start a VC firm and, like, what do you have to do to start a VC firm? So, you know, you already gave us a little bit about, you know, your encouragement to get into VC. But when you started, when you made that decision, like, can you kind of give us an overview of what you had to figure out, what types of resources you had to have, or their financial outlays, et cetera, um, on how to get started with your VC firm? Yeah, I would say um, a pint of blood minimum, um, about 40 gallons of tears, and lots and lots of Xanax. That's, um, oh, you mean really? Okay, got it. Oh, oh and 3 a.m. <laughs> text messages to each other. <laughs> yes, B and I have had many, many conversations via text early morning days uh, where you, know, you can't sleep because you're thinking about fundraising. Um, so you have to set up the legal entities. Um, you know, putting my lawyer hat on, that's first and foremost, making sure that you're properly set up um, as, as a corporation to be able to take on, or as an LLC, as a, uh, to take on the uh, management of the company. And then you have to be able to, uh, it's usually a three-pronged uh, corporate entity structure. Now, I'm not going to speak to that piece because I don't build corporate entities. So talk to your attorney about that one. Uh, but it's really just like building any other company. You have to set up the corporate entities. You have to set up your banking structure. You have to make sure that your marketing is all polished and ready to go. In terms of outlay, I would say you need to be able to go without a paycheck for a while because doesn't you don't know how long you're going to be able to or how long you're going to need to fundraise, especially in this market. It's a super slow fundraise uh, cycle. So I and B and I don't know about you, Kimberly, but we have you know our side hustles, our first companies, as we said, and you know I keep saying that that allows me to be hungry and not thirsty about raising this the right way, right? So it's um, definitely not for the faint of heart which is I think also probably why it's been, you know, a lot of pale mail and stale as we call it that have been running the show because they have the money to do it. So it's more important and, and critical than ever for people that look like us to be getting into this world of change, um, you know, that narrative. Um, I'd say you're looking at a minimum of 100,000 in terms of cash outlay over the first 12 months. 
there's a ton in legal fees, there's a ton in taxes and all the like basic running a company BS aside from otherwise hiring a team that's going to help you build your list out, your databases, um, maybe you're hiring an intern or an analyst to make sure you're doing your deals the right way. Um, I would say the biggest outlay of capital was legal, which is a little offensive to me given that I'm a lawyer, but it's a very specialized focus. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't mess it up because it's regulated, right? Like we are regulated by the SEC. We fuck it up, we go to jail. Like this is not a joke, right? This is a very serious, um, impactful undertaking. Um, and that's kind of my baseline. Like make sure you're, you've got your structure legally together, make sure you have your finance audit and accounting teams together. And that's about hundred K in terms of a out, cash outpour for the first 12 months. One additional thing I think to that is travel. So, you know, oh, yeah. you'll find really quickly that in order to meet LPs, in order to find founders, to, to get more opportunity, um, you're going to probably spend another, I mean, probably another six figures, maybe, depending on how aggressive or not aggressive you are. So, you know, I just, I think it's important that we kind of talk about that because, you know, again, I was kind of surprised that, you know, how many people didn't realize that. And, and so, but it's, so it's an important part, which is also why, you know, if you want to start off with an internship, do it. You know, always to like, you know, <laughs> grow your way into it uh, is definitely a piece of advice I gave someone this week. Who yeah. Asked for a phone call. And B, you've got a full PR team behind you working full time as well. So like we haven't even talked about marketing, which I'm basically cheating on because I've got my agency behind me. That's a whole nother round of uh, outpour in terms of capital if you're going to build it right the first time. Kimberly, I saw that you unmuted. Do you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say, so uh, there are a few things I, I want to I wanna glob onto this. Um, in a hopeful tone. <laughs> <laughs> we we no, love no, what no, we no. do though. Not that, yeah, yeah. We, not that we're not all hopeful, but um, part of the reason why a lot of folks uh, kind of jumped in when they did was between 2019 and 2021, uh, it, funding was, you know, a pretty, pretty readily available, um, certainly harder for first time fund managers, women, people of color, so on and so forth. But, um, but it was possible to get your full fund uh, raised within a 12 month, 18 month period of time, sometimes less. And once the fund is fully raised, then your management fees will cover a lot of the expenses that both B and Laurel are uh, alluded to here. Until Unless then. you're reinvesting, right? So that's what a lot of new funds are doing. I do want to call that out, yeah. which yeah. we're lucky to be able to do. But yeah. you're absolutely right. There was a lot of I wouldn't say dumb money, but there was a lot easier money out in the market for sure. Yeah. So, so the number one, the time frame that it takes now to raise, plus just the amount of, and, and and a lot of that fundraising was done by Zoom. So a lot of us, myself included, for the first bit, got away with not having to travel in order to have those conversations, um, and a lot, and that has changed a lot. Um, in the on, on the hopeful side, you know, things that you should be thinking about are you want to partner with if you decide to partner. I believe we're all solo GPs, but not everyone decides to be a solo GP. Sometimes it's easier to um, raise the fund after you have some soft commits. So if you are spinning out of a corporate, corporate VC, a family, family office, um, somewhere that you can find some startup capital, um, because you too are, are an entrepreneur. So thinking through some startup capital or some side hustles, as Laurel mentioned, uh, to kind of offset some of that cost, that's going to be important. The best advice I got from Charles Hudson, which I don't think was live, like I've spoken to him live, but I think I heard this on a on a recording, was to plan to not cut yourself a paycheck for three years. It is the best advice I got because I did not jump into this blindly. I was fully, fully expecting to never cut myself a paycheck for those for the first three years, and. And I got into this when when it was still when the fundraising cycle had not yet hit its the 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 downside that it, that we're on right now. But um, being conservative in your forecasting of what your actual income looks like and also your fundraising cycle look like looks like is really important. And if you do that, I think you can weather a lot of storms. You can build a, a firm, a fund first, and then a firm over a period of time that is. Um, to, to Laurel's point, hungry, but not thirsty, right? So like that, <laughs> we, we have to kind of change the idea that venture money is fast money and dumb money. 
And like, if you just have the right, you know, network, that's good enough and you just get into any hot deal. So I want to have yeah. that. Uh, and I'll piggyback on that again. Um, you know, I think the good thing about it being a challenging cycle now is that all of the, what we're calling tourist founders and tourist funders, tourist funds are disappearing, right? They're realizing, oh shit, that money isn't as loose as it was a couple of years ago. I need to go get a W-2. Like I actually can't afford to not have a paycheck for two or three years. So I think that um, there's going to be, there is a correction, a market correction that's happening because of this tightening in the funding cycle. Um, but I think in the long run, it's going to make much stronger uh, funds all in all. I will answer, um, I wanna, don't want to mess up your name, Olu, Olusei. Um, your question about my response about reinvesting, when I say reinvest, I am speaking to the management fees. So a lot of times I get questions because my management fee is two and a half percent when a typical is one and a half to two. I did that very intentionally so people would ask that exact question because we are reinvesting that management fee into growing the fund, into hiring diverse teams. And that is a really important part of our narrative. So yes, that's exactly what I mean by reinvesting our management fees. Uh, now to Kimberly's point, we are, once we do our first cap call, of course, we will be, um, I wouldn't say paying ourselves back, but uh, regenerating some of the legal fees that we output uh, ourselves. But a majority of those management fees are going back into hiring diverse team. That's super critical to us. And how we're gonna, again, create a more um, equitable future for a lot of different folks. Thank you for that question. Yeah, and another term that um, is often used is also recycle. Um, so I just wanted to use both terms because Someone asked me that, yeah, I've been getting like so many questions on LinkedIn recently and it makes me feel so, so nice because I'm like, I know all the answers to these things now because I've been doing this. Um, I think the next good question, because we talked, we alluded to structure and that in structure is actually a question that usually ends up um, being a complicated one for folks, especially people who are just getting into what venture capital is. And so Kimberly, maybe you could explain to us, you know, what Laurel was talking about, like the fact that there's structures, but more specifically like the LP, GP and how those people kind of interact together. Yeah. So um, first I'll, I'll just kind of go through the terms. So uh, LP means a limited partner and GP means a general partner. And um, the limited partners are essentially the, the investors. They are uh, limited both in terms of their liability and in terms of their scope, <clears throat> meaning you'll, you'll, you'll invest into the fund, but you're not expected to have a day-to-day -day active management role as part of the fund or um, any of the decision-making abilities or uh, responsibilities for who the fund where the fund invests or, or which startups uh, the fund decides to invest in. The LPs are um, can be an accredited investor, an individual, or it can be an institution or foundation. The important thing to note is that all of those folks, those individuals or institutions or foundations are then um, combined into one entity, which is called, in my case, it's called open, um, OVC Fund One LP. And so all of my investors are um, individuals, foundations, institutionals. They're all combined into that one structure for OVC Fund One LP. And then their investment or commitment amount uh, is basically makes up a percentage of what the total fund's value is. And that is their ownership percentage. The GP, the general partner, is the the team it's it speaks to the team that actually runs the day-to-day -day, um, activities for the fund they have active roles in the fund they are expected to spend a significant amount of their time focused on both building the portfolio um, monitoring and managing the portfolio and making decisions about when's the best time to exit um, how we think about adding additional value to those companies or making follow-on investments um, the structure, and Laurel alluded, this, alluded to this a little bit when she talked about management fees, but essentially the, the most general of structures and all funds you should, if you're deciding to invest in a fund, you should absolutely figure out that fund's dynamics and how they uh, change and shift from what I'm about to say. But the most general of structures for a fund is called a two and 20 model. That two and 20 model stands for 
how it, it talks about how the GP gets compensated, the fund managers, the active day-to-day -day fund managers get compensated. The two means 2%, which is the man management fee. And that 2% is based on the amount of dollars that are actively committed uh, during a period of time. So um, during over a course of a year, you might call capital four times a year. Um, and then of the amount of capital that's been called and committed from the, from the overall fund, you are entitled to a 2% management fee for that, uh, for that period of time. That 2% has to cover <laughs> everything, <laughs> all the things that we need to do that means, and so Laura was talking about reinvesting into her team. Um, it covers income for teams. It covers our expenses. There are management expenses and there are fund expenses, which I will not get into because I mess them up all the time when I send my expenses to Carta. And I'm like, I think that's a fund expense, a fund level expense versus a management expense. But essentially that 2% covers off on all of the management team's needs so that they can continue to run this day to day. And then the 20% speaks to the percentage of the returns that that GP, that management team, is entitled to when there is a return from the fund. So when, when a company within our portfolio exits and we have a wonderful Forex return, we will see that Forex return as a gross number. The, uh, the LPs are entitled to their principal back, the amount of money that they actually put into the fund. The GPs are entitled to 20% of the returns outside of that principal amount. And then the remainder is passed back to the, the LPs, the LP pool based on their ownership percentage. Um, I was gonna say something else about the model two and 20. Um, I think that's it. Is there, are there any, oh, 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 the example I like to use is um, because it's also, this works in, in other industries like, like real estate syndicates as well is if you decided to pool your money together with a bunch of friends to buy an apartment building and then renovate it, um, and all of you were silent partners in that building, but there was one guy that was showing up to work every day and meeting with the contractors, choosing paint colors, shoveling, um, refinancing, making sure there was capital available, leasing the place out, doing all the things, that person is active. That's your GP, that is your active GP. If you're just getting the check <laughs> at the end of the day, that is the limited partner. You're all in it together into that one entity, that one building, but that's the LP versus the GP relationship. And so the GP needs to be compensated for the active work that they're doing. I want to call everyone on the call to the table. What questions do you have? Like we're here talking about ourselves. I have one question come in. Like, do you have no questions? Are we just so educating and empowering you to know all the things about venture? Like, what do you all want to know here? Why are you here? Why did you show up today? What is it that you need to know to be successful as you go out and make your first investments or as you go out and get your first job in venture? What is it that uh, you want to know? Taylor, Karen, Lily. Oh, say you already asked a question and you asked, you're a badass. Thank you so much. Um, she says, I think you referenced it earlier, but what are some workarounds if you raise a smaller fund, 10 to 15 million? Do most LPs require you work on the fund full time? This is a great question and one that I can answer because my fund is a $10 million fund. Um, and I get the question all the time, what, uh, where are you spending your time on your agency or on the fund? I say that I spend my time 80% on the fund and 20% on the agency. Now my agency has been around for 15 years. So we have really operationalized our process and I've got a team of 10 on that side and they're, they're running the show there. But I'm also executing what's called an ESOP and an employee stock option plan. So I'm actually selling the agency back to my team on that side, who is also 100% diverse. So we are furthering the narrative and the mission of Fabric by creating generational wealth within our agency family so that they can create you know, the future that, a future that they might not otherwise um, ever have had the opportunity to build. So I think that it's totally fine to, um, again, as Kimberly said, have side hustles. Um, but what they do want to see in terms of the questions we get is that you're spending a majority of your time on the fund and that you have a future game plan. So not only do they know that I'm spending most of my time on the fund, but I'm also setting myself up to exit the agency eventually. And our goal as, um, as a VC is to have half a billion assets under management or AUM in the next 10 years. So that will require us to focus full time on the fund 
at that time and uh, have a, a, a big team that were running there as well. So they just really just want to see the arc and the thoughtfulness on how you're going to manage your time and what the future state of uh, your fund would look like. Great question. Taylor, Lily, Karen, are there other questions? Oh, go ahead, B. I want to I add a little bit there because I also have a $10 million fund. And one thing that I will tell you that gets really strange is that you'll go to someone and they'll be like, well, you know, like, why won't you just go to 50 million? And I was just like, because I don't have a team to support a $50 million fund. And so I just, I, I, I want to call out moments like that. So for instance, if you're thinking about getting into it, for every dollar you raise, you have to have a plan for how you're going to maximize that dollar, right? And so you need to think about it, like, just like you build any corporation, right? Like, you know, what would it take for your corporation to be successful? And when I thought about what I had by myself, like I came with 10 million. Now I've started to build out a team, I can start to maybe envision like 25 million or something like that, right? But that's only because I now have those resources. And so, you know, this also goes back to this larger idea of like, you know, when we think about this new, like the, 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 like we mentioned dumb money or whatever you want to call it, but this new this new version of BC is going to ask people to be responsible in ways that have not historically had to be responsible. And so now when you think about creating a VC firm, you have to think through all of these complexities, right, on both sides. So like, how do I structure things so I'm responsible and I can be transparent and make sure that, you know, my investors are, are seeing every dollar how it's spent. And then on the founder side, it's like, how do I be more dynamic because we've we realized that those systems where people were just mo mostly hanging out with their friends and investing in their friends, that loses people money. So how do you become more dynamic and use source deals in a better way? And so I just think that's another interesting process in that. And then of course, also something a little bit of nuance of us all being solo GPs. For instance, one of the first things a, a G, uh, LP asked me was, do you have a, a, a plan? And so like you had, like we had to create an estate for the fund about what would happen to the fund if I got like hit by a truck. And I was like, this actually is pretty good because I also have a plan for my family if I get hit by a truck. But you know, it's just those like interesting things that, that, that there are nuances that you have to navigate. Um, yeah, so this is actually a great question, Lily. So how did each of you choose if you did which stage to invest and thoughts on lead versus follow on rounds? Um, Kimberly, I think you can start I'd love to that. take this one. <laughs> I'd love to take this one because something I did, which I, I, I think all of you should do is, um, I'm a big believer in testing and iterating. And so before I wrote a piece of copy about this fund, I socialized it with a number of folks first. And, um, I did so in a way where I, said, I'm running a fund, right? Even before I filed any paperwork, did anything else, I said, I'm running a fund. Here's my thesis. Here's what I'm going to invest in, so on and so forth. And again, this was mid-2022. So um, at that point, things hadn't yet <laughs> really kind of crawled over into the into where we are right now. Um, and I got a lot of pushback. I got a lot of pushback about early versus late and how quickly I could build a track record if I went late stage, because I'd be able to see exits sooner and be able to build a track record faster and then be able to basically raise a mini first fund and then a larger second fund. And something that I think is so important for anyone on this call that is thinking about running their own fund is that you have to really understand your point of differentiation. You can take lots of advice. You can take lots of inputs and factor them into your entire process and your thesis and your model. You can figure out what to take and what to leave, but the thing that should never shift is how you're going to compete, how you're going to actually differentiate. And obviously it can, it can evolve and it can better, get better over a period of time. But as you're starting out, you've got to have conviction in the fact that you can stand out for some reason because there will be so many opinions about what to do. Now, had I taken that advice, I would have made six investments right now in companies that were overpriced that um, would have all taken discounts at this point and either shut down or be doing down rounds. And so my track record would have basically knocked me out the box from day one. And that's not why I didn't take that advice. I actually wasn't even far enough along to not to, to know that that could be a possibility, but I didn't take the advice because I said, wait a second, all I've done my entire career is build things. Like I know how to do, I know how to do zero to one. I know how to do one to 10. I get very bored at, you know, kind of steady state businesses. And so I'm like, I know where I can add value. 
I've proven it. I can show that. I know that's my point of differentiation. And I can't let that not be part of my thesis. I can't let that not be part of my story. It has to be early stage. And so once I made that decision, then I could start to figure out pricing, models, what I should be looking at from a valuation perspective, who I wanted to get after, how I was going to mitigate risk, all these other things. But the the early stage piece, because it's part of of who I am and what I know, I where I know I can add value, but also because it provides the longest runway for a return. And these are long term investments. I don't I don't need an, I don't need a return in a year or two. You, this is this is again patient capital. And um and so if you've decided to invest later stage, that's a completely different strategy that I haven't even studied, frankly, and not a decision I've made for fund one or fund two. But you have to know where or why that would be a better strategy for you. And then I'll take the thoughts on lead versus follow on rounds. Um, so as you go through and figure out which, you know, what your fund model is going to be. So for instance, what Kimberly's talking about being, you know, early, like which stage you're going to choose and things like that, that then starts to help you figure out whether you can be a lead or a follow on. So for instance, as I was going through my model, um, I do, um, you know, pre-seed and seed stage investments. And as I worked with like, you know, my consultant to figure out my model, I was like, okay, well, if I think I want to invest in 2025 companies and 70% are going to fail. What does that look like? And so you end up with 23 companies and the average check size is $350,000. And so that automatically throws you out of being a lead, for instance, on um, most rounds, right? And so a lot of times it's not so much that you need to know this beforehand, it's to start to distill down, like, what is my investment thesis? Then that, that impacts, you know, which stage. And then that impacts with, you know, how much you, you can go look at, you know, various services and figure out on average, what does the check size look like at those rounds? And as you build out your model, you just like throw yourself out of certain categories because you're like, well, in order to actually execute on this, then that means I am restricted to A and I'm going to do it in this way. So that's, that's super important. And then um, Kimberly also looked and mentioned a little bit about this for the, the investment thesis. You can't even go out to market if you don't have an investment thesis. Like, I think we can, all, like, you have to have, a, you have to be opinionated. You can start talking to people about things that you're passionate about, but you can't actually go out to the market until you have an investment thesis. So you should spend the majority of your time. In fact, so Laurel and I both did VC Lab. And that's actually what you spend the majority of your time on is actually developing your thesis and developing something that you can go out to market on. By the way, the only reason I'm, I'm going through those two pretty quickly is that we're almost at the end. And I thought this co-investments one was a really great question to get into because this is something that um, you got to figure out. So Laurel, uh, what about co-investments? Do you consider those and why or why not thought process on it? This is a very loaded question in my opinion, especially at the stage of the play that we are in. Um, so I think co-investment in terms of co-VC investment is always welcome, right? If you invest in a company, you want that company to succeed, you want to find other VCs that are going to invest alongside you in that company. Co-invest is in terms of LPs, I think is a little bit cheating in my book. I feel like if you want to glom onto my coattails and invest in a company that I've done all the diligence on, but you're not an LP in my fund, it's like, it's cheating a little bit. Now that's not an absolute. And I don't know, Kimberly, if you feel the same way, but I, I, I feel like it's a little rude, frankly, like they, if they believe that this is a company that they should invest in, why are they not taking a bigger path and investing in the fund and by way of the fund then investing in that deal? That's kind of how I, I envision it. And also doing sidecars and side deals and co-invest and things like that can get really, really messy from a, uh, just from a structure perspective, I'd rather see them come in, invest in the fund and invest in whatever that company is via that fund to show support in your mission, your vision and your values for building a brighter future. That's my take on it. Not everyone agrees with it. It's, it can be very controversial, but it does feel to me like they're just looking to cheat a little bit and have you do the hard work and they're just kind of on for the ride. And I'm not, I'm not here for that. Kimberly, any opinions on that one? Oh, um, yeah, I think Laurel's right. The the opinions are all over the place on this. And again, I think you have to decide how, if you're going to use co-investments, you have to decide how you're going to use it as part of your strategy. So if it's, if you're a small VC 
and you can be the first to diligence and your investment memos are great. And this, this happened to me a, a couple of times. Your investment memos are great. You want to help your, your entrepreneur find more, more funding. And you say, you know, some larger VCs and they are willing to kind of take a first conversation based on your recommendation. That's great. That looks great for you down the line. Cause then you can tell a story about writing a small check, but having a larger impact. Laurel's point about having individual investors that are investing alongside of you versus with you is absolutely right. And it's happening to a lot of newer investor, you newer fund managers, women, people of color, where um, someone will ask you for a meeting, you'll take the meeting, they'll want to know what your pipeline looks like. So all of the work that we're doing, by the way, I'm paid. Okay. So <laughs> all of the work that we're doing to build our reputation, to get people to want to come to us first, to build um, a reputation, to set out our niche and our domain expertise, to find these incredible deals at incredible values. And then someone comes along and says, hey, we don't actually want to pay you for that. We don't want to invest along with you. We want to invest alongside you because thank you, that was a good deal, but we don't trust you. You know, that's kind of what it says. That's one. Um, and while that may have worked in the past, I, I think most of us are getting to the point where we're like, absolutely not. We're not going to show you our whole deal flow. That's the first thing. The, the one area, the one caveat I have is if someone that is already on my cap table says, hey, I love this thing. And my based on my ownership percentage within your fund, I don't have enough exposure. I want to write another check. Have at it that's a great thing, right? Like that means that you trust me enough to find a deal. You trust me enough to bring you the information and you love the company so much that you're going to double down. That's great. Like I, I would love that as a situation. Yeah. I mean, I think the high level is you need to see some, some re reciprocity, right? Whether it's VC, you know, peers, whether it's potential LPs on your cap table, you just want to like any one of us knows that the more we can bring to people, um, to, to ensure that their rounds are completely, you know, full, right, is great. But we need to see performance from other individuals or else it feels like you're kind of being used and no one wants to be used. And this last question um, is about due diligence. So like, you know, at the early stage, what are some strategies you implement and or do you utilize advisors? Um, I need to start. I, I don't know anyone who doesn't have some version of advisors, like some some people, because no matter what industry it is, like you usually end up at some point where you might need some help on something. So advisors are pretty standard that you might have someone. So for instance, um, I have an advisor, for instance, it's in like construction and we were looking at construction deals. So I was like, oh, can you, you know, take a look and look at your network and things like that. Um, early stage though is a little complicated because especially if you're pre-seed, you know, they may not have any financial, you know, records or any performance. And so you end up doing a lot of like leaning into like confidence in the founder, you know, looking at people in the industry, doing like informal, informal surveys and things like that saying, you know, if this particular tool or service or something like that existed today, would you buy it? So you try to find like some level of confidence that the ideal actually has some, some legs to it. Um, those types of things. Although I was talking to someone in healthcare recently who only does healthcare deals. And she was talking about the fact that healthcare is so, like it takes so long for healthcare to go. Like you're really just looking at, okay, is this the person who figured out that RNA can be like blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay, well, so there's a high likelihood that that person might be able to generate something else. So depending on your industry, it gets a little bit weirder about how you might go through it. But that's just a couple high level for me. Laurel or Kimberly, anything additional? Yeah, I would say for diligence, um, again, you got to kind of figure out your framework, right? So there's you're you're going to be making a bet on a lot of different things, no matter where you are in the diligence process. But there's got to be something that you have incredible amounts of conviction on, and um, and that has to be your starting place. So I have three different frameworks that I use. I'm not going to give them all to you, right? <laughs> because again, they're my my competitive advantage. But the easiest one, which is not even mine, it's just the way that I was taught to assess any business when I was in when I was a management consultant is across people, process, and technology. And so, if you can't feel like a ton of conviction across one of those three areas, um, and whatever it, whatever your process is for, for 
for conviction. There are only 10 people in the world that know how to use this technology, and this is one of them, and they are raising a fund to build something incredible with te this technology, that's conviction. Um, or to B's point, someone has figured out how to do something with RNA in a way that nobody else has figured out in the people category, that's conviction. And usually you can find a lot of conviction on the people side based on their previous experiences, um, or their network, or if they're previous founders, um, they've exited a company before, something of that nature. Uh, and then the profit side is really more about like business model and um, opportunity sales or, or size of market or something of that nature that really gets you to the point where you can think um, this person has an outsized opportunity. They, are, they have a competitive advantage. They have a head start. They have um, a partnership. They have what, what is it that they have that will make it possible for them to get to whatever the traction point is you really want to see next? Like, I think we, from an early stage, we think way too far out about exits. And it's like, let them make $10,000. Like, can they make $10,000? And so you want to start thinking through, like, what are the things that make you believe that this person can make 10000 Then can you believe they can make a million? Then can you believe that they make $10 million? So on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my only addition to that is, you know, our secret sauce is on the marketing side. So we actually do a second layer of diligence for all of our companies. We run them through our listening software and we do a competitive marketing assessment. So that is how we do our diligence, aside from all the traditional founder financial diligence, um, because our secret sauce is marketing support and actually making these companies winners through omnichannel marketing efforts. So we have our own proprietary diligence approach that we take. And that's actually what our LP has been most excited about um, in terms of our secret differentiating sauce. And just one last comment, because we mostly addressed early stage because we're all in early stage. Obviously, when you're in later stage, there's so many more pieces of information. So, for instance, you should have, you know, uh, financial records that have been audited so you can clearly see what their track record has been. You should be able to go to their top customers and all these other types of people and actually specifically see it. You should be able to see like many industry, you know, analysis and tools that will say like this particular, you know, company, you know, has some kind of advantage. And so, you know, presumably, you know, any reasonable later stage company, there's so many pieces of data that you could look at to at least understand generally what value that they might have. And the real differentiator then probably is, do you think that they have a higher likelihood of succeeding versus you know X, Y, Z, other person in their industry? Um, but of course, since we don't, none of us really specialize in that, that's just like a high level that you would, of course, obviously, you know, kind of figure out your own process. So, yeah, we did it. Y'all did it, yeah, we did it. We, we got through number four. We got through September. This is beautiful, this is lovely. Like, honestly, um, we delight in being able to share this spaces with y'all. As I mentioned earlier, we do record these. And so I'll send it back out um, to folks. Feel free to share it amongst your network. We do these every month, the third Thursday of the month. So if you come across anyone, uh, actually, no, except for next month, because Laura and I both, like, we're, like apparently people like us and so they invited we're us busy, to, we're busy. to speak and stuff. <laughs> and so we are, next month is the one month where we're not doing another third Thursday, but it is updated on the event, right? So feel free to share it with your friends who have these questions. And of course, I will also share like our LinkedIn and things like that. So you can go through and um, reach out to us if you have any more questions. And again, I actually really like the questions, but just keep in mind that now that I get a few of them, it sometimes takes me a week to answer so don't don't be sad if I don't answer immediately because I also have a toddler and my life is hectic. Um, and on that note, we want to thank B for hosting us as always, Kimberly for being our guest a go go today. Kimberly, you have so many uh, more like detailed pieces of information. I like want to pick your brain so much. Um, <laughs> thank you for being our guest, and thank you always to B for organizing this amazing group and for being my bestie. Bye y'all. <laughs>